For more information on tutoring, personalized video solutions, or how to support MOOF University and the production of more videos, check out MOOFUniversity.com. Thank you and enjoy. Okay, so in this video, I'd like to talk about the regulation of the urea cycle. And the urea cycle ha is both regulated under sort of long-term regulation as well as short-term regulation. So let's start with the long-term. Long-term regulation is based on nitrogen flux, which is basically substrate availability. What I mean by that is I'm talking about how much nitrogen or specifically how much ammonium ion is coming to the urea cycle over time. Because the whole point of the urea cycle is to take that ammonium ion and sort of process it, detoxify it, put it into urea and excrete it safely, right? So um, long term, the activity of the urea cycle is going to be based on how much nitrogen is actually going to be processed. If there's an increase in nitrogen flux, what's going to happen is there's going to be an increase in the synthesis of urea cycle enzymes in the liver. And that, of course, will increase urea production. And when I say the increase increased synthesis of urea cycle enzymes, I'm talking about um, ornithine, transcarb ornithine transcarbamylase, arginosuccinase synthetase, arginosuccinase, arginase, and of course, carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1, or CPS1. These are the enzymes that are involved in the urea cycle. So as more nitrogen comes to the, um, the urea cycle, more, more ammonium ions coming to the urea cycle to be processed, that will basically cause the, uh, the increase in synthesis of these enzymes. So we have more enzymes around so that we can uh, process that, that ammonium ion more and produce more urea. And of course, the opposite is true, is that if there's a decrease in nitrogen flux, there's going to be a decrease in the synthesis of the urea cycle enzymes in the liver, and thus we'll have a decrease in urea production because we won't be producing as much urea, urea if there's not a lot of NH4 plus to be processed and turned into urea. So how, as far as long, the long-term regulation, how would, um, what would happen if there was a high protein diet? Well, if there's a high protein diet, there's a large intake of uh, amino acids and lots of nitrogen. So if there's a lot of nitrogen, a lot of ammonium ions gonna go to the urea cycle. And so there should be an increase in the production of these enzymes and producing more urea, increase urea synthesis. The opposite would be true for a low protein diet. There's less nitrogen flux, less nitrogen coming to the urea cycle uh, to be processed. There's gonna be less urea synthesis. Now, how would that work with starvation? Well, under starvation conditions, there are no carbohydrates or fats to be used for energy. The body taps on muscle protein. And so if it's catabolizing muscle protein, there's going to be a lot of ammonium ion that results from that. And that needs to be processed and turned into urea. So there's an increase in urea synthesis during starvation conditions. Okay. So that's pretty much it for long-term regulation. What about short-term? Okay. As far as short-term regulation, it's basically the allosteric regulation of the committed step. specifically the CPS1 step, carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1, which of course takes the bicarbonate or carbon dioxide and ammonium ion and turns it into carbamyl phosphate with the help of two ATPs. Okay. Now, this enzyme is stimulated, it is activated by a regulator called N-acetylglutamate. What is N-acetylglutamate? Well, if you look at the portion sort of drawn in white here, that portion is just the amino acid glutamate. So that's where that portion of the name comes from. The glutamate just comes from the fact that that's glutamate. Um, the N-acetyl, basically we have an acetyl group here shown in brown, N-acetyl. That acetyl group is attached to glutamate's nitrogen. It's, uh, it's amino nitrogen, hence the name N-acetyl glutamate. Now apparently this molecule exists in mammals pretty much exclusively to activate CPS1. So what's the deal with this thing? Why does this thing activate CPS1? And how is it made? Well, it's made from acetyl-CoA and glutamate. Um, basically what happens is that acetyl-CoA's acetyl group uh, is what ends up getting attached to the nitrogen of glutamate and this coenzyme A ends up leaving. 
that uh, reaction is catalyzed by N-acetylglutamate synthetase, oh, sorry, N-acetylglutamate synthase, not synthetase, synthase or NAGS. And um, this enzyme is actually activated by arginine. So what's the deal with that? Why would that make sense? How does arginine's activation of NAGS make sense? Well, if, if arginine is activating the production of N-acetylglutamate, you can kind of think about it by extension that arginine is kind of stimulating, a buildup of arginine is kind of stimulating CPS1. If, it's, if arginine is stimulating the production of the activator of the committed step of the urea cycle, that means basically that high amounts of arginine are stimulating CPS1, right? Not directly, but indirectly. So the way I think about it is lots of arginine. Well, arginine is amino acid. If there's lots of arginine around, it indicates a high amount of amino acids around. And that would make sense if a high amount of amino acids are around, you would want, if we're, if we're processing them, processing, processing the, the uh, nitrogen from them, it would make sense that a high amount of amino acids would stimulate the urea cycle. So that's kind of what's going on here. Lots of arginine indicates high amount of amino acids, high amount of amino acids, stimulating or activating the committed enzyme. Okay. And I hope that makes sense. I hope that video was helpful. Thank you for watching. If you found that video helpful, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share with friends. Thank you and happy studying.